Boom. Chris, thank you for coming on the show. I got to start out with the first question, which is, what's your favorite superhero? My favorite superhero? That's yeah. a good question, man. You know what? Um, in all honesty, I'd probably have to say Wolverine. Ooh, Wolverine. Why do you yeah. think that? Um, I, I, like, I like the toughness aspect, you know, that he has. And, and then the guy also has the ability to love. You know, it seems like all the other superheroes, um, they really, uh, they're, 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 for the most part, I feel like they're just, you know, happy go lucky all the time. Yeah. You know, like they, they don't really like, they've kind of accepted like, yeah, I'm a mutant and, um, and I help people. And then, uh, Logan is kind of like, you know, he's torn between this, like, I don't want to do this, but. I know what I am and I have to do it yep. and I'm mad at the world, but I still, you know, because I lost the woman that I love and, you know, but I still have the ability to love. I like the dynamic of his emotions. Totally. Um, and then just the fact that he's got an adamantium skeleton, you know, and he just kind of like rejuvenates on, on at will and whatnot. Um, that, that to me is like super, du super duper cool coming from a guy who has two knee surgeries, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. I wish I had had the ability to just self heal in a second. And uh, uh, an adamantium skeleton seems to be uh, pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, so okay, that's perfect. Then. <laughs> so liking Logan self healing two knee surgeries, let's go back to I guess the beginning of your journey, this path down the entrepreneurial route. Um, and right you know, learning how to help, uh, whether it's joint pain, whether it's consciousness, you know, there's a million different uh, paths that we can explore. Let's just start at yeah. the inception of where you were like, yeah, I think this is the call to my hero's journey. Like, I got to go do this. So uh, I quit playing football uh, when I was in my sophomore year in college. And uh, I was like, man, you know, what do I do now? Uh, I just, uh, I, I wasn't, it's not that I wasn't cut out for football. It just wasn't the career path for me, mm -hmm. right? I'm glad that I was smart enough to, you know, let go of that egotistical portion of me that wanted to suit up and tell, you know, girls that I played football. But uh, I ended up quitting football and I got a job as a personal trainer at a gym. And I started doing very well for myself. And my boss sat me down and he said, Hey man, you know, it seems like you got a knack for this. Like how far do you want to take it? And I said, shoot, I don't know, you know, as far as I can. And he said, well, if you want to make a career out of this, the best certification that you can have is a CSCS certified strength conditioning specialist. So I was like, okay, well, how do I get it? And he says, well, you got to sign up for it. You got to study for it, but they won't give you a certificate. Um, until you have a four-year degree. So he gave me the textbook that you need to study for the test, and I read it in a week. And I was like, the first, you know, the first, not just the first book, but yeah. especially the first textbook that I was like, okay, like how come I can sit down and read 687 pages of a double-margin small font textbook? But if you put me in, let's say, like a literature class or social <laughs> studies or something like that, like I'm zonked out in 11 seconds and I just can't keep my focus. So um, I couldn't, I was like a sponge. I was absorbing everything in this book. I took the test in uh, 1990, 1999 um, in Pittsburgh in September and I passed with flying colors. Um, had to wait two more years to get my once I got my four year degree to get my cert certificate. But I then went to, back to my coaches that I played football for and I said, Hey, you mind if I be like a student assistant strength and conditioning coach and just help you guys around here? So I got, I got paid a whopping $432 a month oh my God. Um, for, for working pretty much, you know, about 50 to 60 hours a week. And it did not feel like work. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't. And I, bro, you're, you know, I started off um, washing dishes at the Hearthstone Manor. So that was 4 p.m. to 12 p.m. You know, humidity is about 110. 
the temperature in the in the kitchen is about 110. Um, I'm breaking glasses, slicing my hands open, bending over for hours, scrubbing pots and pans. So I knew what work was like, mm-hmm. you know. And it was just like you get that, you know. Back then, it's like you work an entire month and you you make a thousand dollars, and it's like. <laughs> you know, you're 17 or 18 and you're like, what do I do with this money? Like, oh my gosh, it's so worth it. But every day at work, you know, it was just like, oh God, this sucks, man. Like, I don't want to, I do not want to wash the uh, pot, the pots that the twice baked potatoes are made in. Like everything is like this much is crusted on the bottom, you know? And when I started doing everything with um, strength and conditioning, not a single day felt like I was at work. So that was the epiphany point for me. And then I had some of the coaches coming up and being like, Hey man, you know, you would make a really good coach right now, anywhere at any university after working there a couple of months. And I was like, really, uh, you know, thank you very much. And I I took it to heart. I got a graduate assistantship Mm -hmm. position, um, at the university of Hawaii. So I was working with all the athletes out there. They paid for me to work out there, paid for my education. And I got my master's in kinesiology and the the rest is history, man. The rest is really, you know, honestly, just finding my niche, Mm. which I'm sure, I'm sure we'll go get into, but, uh, that, that's the story, man. That's awesome. So Hawaii, was that like time of your life? It, It was man. I miss it every day. I love the people out there. I got a lot of great friends out there still. I visit once a year. Um, yeah. And, uh, um, you know, you really, it's really, it's one of those places that's just kind of super magical, man. Yeah. Um, you don't, you know, everybody talks about how the Islanders are so laid back. And that's because when you're out there, like down here in South Florida, Bro, every day, it, people are hustling. It's like the hustle and bustle capital of the world. You know, um, at like 7 a.m., the highways are packed. You know, people are honking at each other. They're trying to get from A to B. And it, it's the same way in Hawaii. You know, the highways are packed, but they're packed because people are just going 35 miles an hour on the H1. <laughs> and, and they don't care. You know, yeah. they're just like, I don't know. I got to get to work, but I don't really have to be on time. You know, that's, that's the attitude out there. So, um, I'm glad that it, you know, it it doesn't kill your ambition, but it helps you slow down, enjoy the small things, really enjoy the big things. And every single day is, you know, just like you're in God's own personal land. Mm -hmm. You got the sand, the surf, the sea and the mountains. You know, it just, there's yeah. nothing that's left out. You got the best fish available. Um, and then they fly in a lot, a lot of the meat from the big Island, you know, where everything is still sustainably and organically raised. So, uh, yeah, the food might be a little bit more expensive, but it's just all, overall yeah. all around. It's amazing. I, I tell people that rather than social security, there should be a government program that sends everybody to Hawaii for a week out of their life. Yeah, like you just you know you draw you get to be 18 years old and you get to pick one week yep. you know between 18 and 25 you get to pick one week where the government just pays for you to go out to Hawaii and dude I have in. have a vacation I I'm in for that so that duality between the slow and the fast and uh, what you term the ever space how yeah. do those coincide because it seems like there's a lot of there's probably some good like you saw one way and another way based on coming yeah. from New York coming and then living in Hawaii yeah. how did that help contribute to uh, your concept um, with consciousness and being present honestly man it turned off a lot of the hate that I had in my body and in my mind uh, when I was living in New York I didn't like living in Buffalo New York you know I was 14 13 years 13 14 years old and my parents took us down to West Palm Beach. They had a condominium there, very modest condominium. Uh, and, and they took us down for Easter every year. And I can remember quite a few times asking my mom when we would come back up to New York, I'd be like, why do we live here, mom? <laughs> oh, you know, because your family's up here and your father has his businesses. And I'm like, yeah, but can't dad sell his businesses and we can live down in Florida? Like, it's beautiful. Yeah. there and all year round it's may 6th and it just snowed 
Like, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I was sick of it already at such a young age. So when I got the opportunity to go out to Hawaii for everybody is, is all about the, the Aloha spirit for the most part, you still yeah. like anywhere you have your one or two bad apples. And unfortunately that story gets out on a national level, mm -hmm. you know, some local guy punched a, tourist or something like that for asking them to take a picture of them whatever and uh everybody's like oh you know there it's not safe out in hawaii no man i <laughs> i lived there for eight and a half years i had absolutely zero problems i never had anybody want to fight me um everybody is just about the aloha spirit and then like i said you know you get that one or two people that where they're just they don't like life and it doesn't matter where they are they're miserable <laughs> And uh, you got a bad apple here and there, whatever. You'll find that in Wichita, Kansas. You know, yeah. it, it doesn't matter. Um, but really living on the island and um, becoming friends with um, one of my friends who, who I trained to be in the Navy SEALs. So his name kind of has to remain nameless right now. Mm -hmm. um, this kid really taught me to open my heart to people that I don't have anything in mm -hmm. common with. And that was probably another huge step to me becoming like a servant leader. And that's what I do in my business. I'm not about, Hey, you know, how can this person help me? I'm yeah. all about like, what can I do for this person? Um, how can I show up the best way possible to do what they need? Mm -hmm. And I was all about, you know, first impressions, how people look, and uh, I remember, so him and I, you know, we're big, we're meatheads, we're lifting really heavy weight. And <clears throat> there was this kid that came in uh, to the weight room fresh off the plane from Japan, and his name was Shin, S-H-I-N, okay? <laughs> and he barely spoke English, and I see him over there talking to Shin, and I'm just like, what is he talking to that that geek for what's he talking to that little nerd for man I'm like come on man we got to get back to work we got to get we got to train like what are you doing and then he's over there talking to him laughing like everything <laughs> so he comes back and I'm like who is that and he's like oh man that dude's so cool he wants to get an internship in here and like mop the floors and sweep and I'm like yeah that's probably all he's good for like let's go and train and he's like no man he's so cool so he started hanging out with this kid and I'm just like what are you wasting your time for? Why are you hanging out with these dorks? You know, and yeah. I, start, I noticed that he, he never shut anybody out of his life, mm -hmm. no matter what they look like. And I feel like he is the way where, where he is, not only because, because of his work ethic, but because he, he always keeps his heart open, you know, like any opportunity, anything like that. And uh, that was a huge lesson to me because in New York, it's, Kind of like if I don't know you, like stay away from me. Yeah, you know. And if you're trying to get to know me, and I don't want to get to know you, stay away from me. You know, like there's the, there's just that um, curtain right there. So when I started to open my heart a lot more, live the aloha spirit, um, a, a lot of things changed for me. Uh, I, I I became pretty much like a big softy. You know, I just started mm -hmm. to love everybody. And I realized like, wow, like if you say yes to life, a lot of cool things happen, you know, um, and, and really it all comes down to self-awareness and, uh, the seven principles that I wrote about in the Everspace, um, they all come down to the last one, which is about creating self-awareness. Mm. Okay. And I tell people it's a catharsis book. Like I'm, I'm writing it to my younger self. You know, so if, if I was like 13, 14, and I could give myself that book, I feel like I would have accelerated a lot of things yeah. in my life. And uh, the basic premise is in, in the first, uh, first chapter, I talk about everything being all about perspective. And I'm like, you know, if you live in a town and uh, you, you just built this town and you're very proud of it and somebody comes along and says, hey, can I stay here for the night? And you're like, yeah. And then another person comes along and you're like, hey, can I stay here for the night? And you go, yeah, sure. And they wake up in the morning and one guy complains about, you know, it was too loud. And then he's complaining that the outhouse was too far. And he's asking, like, where's my breakfast? It said, you know, free breakfast in the morning. And 
he's just super unappreciative. And then the other person wakes up and they're like, oh man, you know, like I heard the crickets all night and I just fell asleep and I loved it. And then I got up and I had to get up in the middle of the night and go to the outhouse and man, like the stars were absolutely beautiful. And then he just shows up and says, oh, you know, you don't have breakfast yet. You want me to go and help you hunt or bring something back so we can all share and just thank you so much for building this place. Uh, I go, you know, which person would you rather cater to? And I tell people, I go, so from, from God's perspective, who is going to win in the end? You know, the person that's viewing everything as negative and God doesn't have any, he doesn't sit there and say, Hey, you know, you should change. He, you know, you might create co-create a life event to force you to change, but the person that's super duper positive, you know, you're going to have a better energy exchange, mm. a better connection with the source, with the divine, with God, with Allah, like whatever you want to say your deity is, you're going to have a better connection and life is just going to flow through you a lot mm. better. And like I said, when you put up walls and, and you stop stuff from coming in, um, that's when you start to almost slow down your own life force. And it's almost instead of self-awareness, you're creating self-detriment, you know, mm. but because you're doing it and you think that it's good for you, it's really not, yeah. uh, you're going to get stuck a lot. You're, you're, you're going to be stuck a lot. Totally. So uh, this, uh, I'm going to kind of transition this into a cool area, but with the, the guy who says no, who's pessimistic, who's putting up walls now, I've read some of like the body remembers and books like that. How do you think that interplays with how we move with like the fascia, with the understanding of the body? And because they, they definitely seem to at least connect or how I've seen it, you can tell someone's posture and what someone's like, basically yeah. when they walk into the room, they're like, ah, where they're like yeah. super laid back, chill. So every emotion that, that is created or elicited in our body, it starts in our brain as a neuron. It, it then transform into, transforms into a neuropeptide. It travels down along the nervous system and then into a specific organ. And then it will, it will continue on through a specific muscle. Okay, think about it. When you're raving mad, like your head is hot, your eyes are going to bug out. And guess what? Your heart and your respiration are through the roof, right? Oh. And what does that do? head, neck, and shoulders, maybe even your arms, super tense, super, super tense. You get anxiety, and what happens? You have butterflies in your stomach, right? Mm -hmm. So everything tran translates, starts in the brain, starts first in the environment and your reaction to it, mm -hmm. okay? And then it starts in the brain. It transmits to an organ. Every single organ is tied to a muscle. And when we start to affect our muscles, we're going to affect our fascia. Okay. That's from an emotional standpoint. Now couple that with really, really a, a, a poor posture standpoint or poor weightlifting standpoint, or just a poor movement standpoint mm -hmm. in general, and you accelerate those problems. So a lot of times, you know, when I've been working on people, not, not very frequently at all, maybe one or two times a year, I've, I have had people have emotional releases, mm. and, you know, and they're just like, they're like it'll, it'll be reminiscent of something that happened, you know, eight years ago, 10 years ago. And they never knew, they never understood, wow, like I never worked through that emotion. Yeah. So when you release it through the tissue, now all of a sudden it's brought out and the body can actually let it go. Wow. That's so interesting. Yeah, I, I noticed definitely like if I'm doing a longer yoga session, like 60 or 90 minutes, I'll have like these recursive thoughts and stuff come up in positions and I'll be like, why? I got to trace that down. Like, why is this yeah. happening right now? Yeah. So I want to I like Freudian uh, psychoanalyze myself and be like, Austin, why did you think that? Why are you thinking this about thinking that? And then I yeah. <laughs> go on yeah. and on. Yeah, absolutely. It's all connected, man. Our body is so incredibly dynamic. Um, and, and, you know, we're only just starting to scratch the surface on what the fascia can do and what, what the, uh, what the fascia is all about.
I mean, we probably got another hundred years before mm -hmm. we figure out how the body actually works. Yeah. But we're starting to get, uh, definitely get a, a, a better, different grasp. You know, it's not all about pills, shots, and surgery. It's not even about PT. It's not even about massage or chiropractic. Mm -hmm. It's beyond that. You know, it's a well, well beyond that. So then with your understanding and your approach, how would you target certain fascial areas or help with the release and the use of fascia properly? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> we, only, we only have 35 minutes left. It looks like, bro. I mean, that's all we're going to talk about. There are, there are probably every single time I'm working on somebody, especially some of my high profile athletes, um, Typically when I'm working on, let's say a CrossFitter or a, I don't know, stay at home mom or just a working dad, I'll use anywhere between three and five techniques in mm -hmm. order to get them fixed. When I'm working on my high profile athletes, I'll use between seven and nine different techniques. Okay. And, uh, you know, we have, um, we, we have direct pressure. We have cross friction. We have gliding. We have Rolfing, we have um, uh, my at Atlas correction te techniques, mm -hmm. which I always start off with. We have Chapman points, we have cranial points, we have lymph nodes that I, that I need to work on. I mean, everything and anything, and it's mm -hmm. always dictated by the individual. It's dictated by how their body tightened up and why it tightened up, mm. all right? Um, so that's, that's really first and foremost. And, you know, muscles tell a story. You need experience, but most importantly, you need intuition to know which one to use. Sometimes it's just, you know, seek and destroy. Sometimes it's a crapshoot. Okay, try that. Didn't really work. All right, try this. Didn't really work. Try that. Oh, look at that. We got a fantastic release. You know, there it is. So... I tell people it's not necessarily the fact that chiropractors are bad or massage therapists are bad or PTs are bad or osteopaths are bad. None of them are bad. They are held back mm -hmm. by their own knowledge and beliefs of just one modality of healing the body. Okay, that's it. We are cars. We are, we are machines, but we are not cars. Okay. Yeah. Every mechanic is going to change your carburetor or change your oil the same exact way. All right. But if I have back pain and you have back pain, I may treat, we may get treated differently, but yeah. the same. Okay. Differently, but the same. It's going to be pressure. It's going to be a little bit of, uh, it's, it's going to be pressure. It's going to be a little bit of brushing. It's going to be a little bit of stretching. And then it's going to be a little bit of strengthening, but we may be, getting worked on in completely different areas mm -hmm. and we might have to do completely different stretches and we might have to do completely different exercises to re-educate those nerves. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's different, but the same. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I know even like, uh, so strange, but from the carnivore diet, like a lot of people, they're like apples cause back pain. I'm like that's the weirdest thing. Just from eating apples. I, I, know I, I don't, I, I, <laughs> I don't know about that, man. I, yeah. I really don't know about that. I didn't read about it. I didn't hear about it. Um, I get it. I get the whole premise behind the carnivore yeah. diet. I just try not to do anything anymore in extremes. Yes. You know, when I was in my 20s and maybe even early 30s, I experimented with my body all the time. But for me, sure. I'm all about the spectrum, right? Yeah. Like we're here we have animals to eat we have plants to eat we have mm -hmm. fruits to eat we have yeah. sea creatures to eat you know like just dabble and have something of everything the yeah. last thing that you want to be eating is something that man made yeah man oh. man man doesn't know how to make food bro you know what i'm saying and that's what i say in my that's what i say in uh, in my book the death of dieting i say you know eat the <clears throat> Eat the, an eat the plants that the animals eat, eat the animals that eat the plants, and eat the fish that swim in the sea. Yeah. You know, like, eat, eat the plants that come from the ground, eat the animals that eat the plants, and then eat the fish that come from the sea, and drink water. 
Yeah. You know, and everybody's like, oh, but, you know, I need to electrolytes for my workout. No, no. If you live in the United States, you are not suffering from a <laughs> lack of electrolytes. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. You know, if we're somewhere in Rwanda and you haven't had any food or water for nine days, then yeah, man, you might want to supplement with electrolytes, but you know, you're fine. If you're in living in the United States, um, you know, it just doesn't matter. You're fine. You're okay. Totally. Yeah. And, and with this, uh, Cause I'm, I'm basically a uh, Nutrivore, I guess you could say, I don't know. I don't like to put a label on it. I just eat kind of, yeah. I just eat real food. Yeah. Just that's try it. To, like, stick to that. It's super easy. It tastes great. Um, yeah. But with that and with, so that's another external stressor, all of this combined when you are seeing people, how, how does their, their mindset, their diet, the environment, the lifestyle more, affect the body and how it works than just like hey i was doing i did too many bicep curls and blew out my uh my elbow yeah so the underlying cause of all disease is stress that's number one all right so there are some people that i see and i work with i get them on the table immediately and start working on them and uh their tissue doesn't move they mm -hmm. they feel you know they feel like um wolverine and I'm just like, do you, is this all steel or, you know, and I start asking them about their lifestyle and what they're doing. And they're just, they're like, yeah, man, I just, I'm in a high stress job. Mm. And then the, the second underlying cause of disease, this is one A and one B. Okay. It's not number one and two is inflammation. So inflammation is going to be both a product of your environment and your nutrition. Mm -hmm. All right. So how stressed out are you? And then what do you eat like? All right. So we always have to start there. A majority of the people that I see, they just have a movement fault that I need mm -hmm. to correct. Okay. We correct the muscle tissue first, then we re-educate them second. There's a very small percentage of people that I see that have a really serious lifestyle problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where, you know, I, I'll talk to someone and, and say, um, well, it, it, you seem a little bit inflamed. Are you eating a lot of sugar? Oh no, no, I don't eat a lot of sugar. Okay. What'd you have for breakfast today? Uh, I started off with a bran muffin and then orange juice. And I'm like, okay, both of those are sugar. Yeah. But it, what, no, no, no. My bran muffin has fiber in, and it, it's good grains. No, it's basically liquefied into sugar when your body yeah. digests it. And have you looked at the container of the orange juice? You know, <laughs> 27 to 29 grams of sugar, not carbohydrates, 20 yeah. to 27 to 29 grams of sugar, straight sugar in the orange juice. And, oh, well, and then they say, well, what do I eat? What, what do I eat for breakfast? And I'm like, oh boy, here we go. You know, like yeah. uh, that to me is how... And it's not their fault, you know. It's yeah. the American, the, the American food system. All these companies, they they trick you, they trick you with all this hyper marketing to get somebody like Jamie Lee Curtis to, you know, sponsor new Tivia, and uh, then all of a sudden, when somebody wakes up and says, you know what, I'm actually going to test this shit. Yeah. And they go ahead and they test it, and they're like, all the bacteria is dead. Yeah. In, yeah. in the yogurt, and then they get sued. Yep. You know, like you're, you're not providing a great product. That's hyper marketing totally. right there, you know, and it's not the people that consume. I, I'm 50, 50, man. It's not their fault, but then at the same time it is because yeah. if you're not, you obviously educated yourself prior mm -hmm. to talking to me. Right. So yeah. it's not like I'm schooling you with all this knowledge right now. And you're just in the back of your head, like, Oh God, I, I'm eating so wrong right now. <laughs> I, I just had four Twix bars for lunch. Ah, like, but I love Twix. I probably, I probably shouldn't do that anymore. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so um, it is part laziness, part ignorance, part um, just lack of, lack of being like, you know what? I'm going to find the truth. And maybe totally. they're too trusting and being like, okay, if Jamie, Jamie Lee Curtis says it's good for me, I don't care. Yeah. I'm going and getting it. You know, where you always got to be skeptical, man. You always oh, got to yeah. be skeptical. Yeah, that's that's the hardest thing because I think about this a lot. Like, how do you, where does it stem from? And I think 
you know, a lot of it goes back to, I think, the school system. And so how, like, for the majority of time, you have, like, some expert, quote-unquote, teacher telling you what's right. And then if you take a test and you get things wrong, you never even get to correct it. So it's like everything was how it is forever. There's never like, oh, I want to tamper. And it's like, stop. What are you doing? Just follow the, come on, get back on the bus. Where are you going? It's like this whole society where we're groomed to be like, and then you try something out of the norm and then your friends and family are like, what are you doing? Huh? What's, uh, yeah. What are you doing over there? You're like, I'm using a red light. They're like, why are you using a red light? Now I got everybody using a red light, but you know, it just takes a little time to make the weird the norm. And then everyone's like, right better and like changes everything robert kiyosaki said it best he said in school you get the answers first then you get the test yep. and he said in life you get the test first you get the questions and then you have to go and find the answers yeah and, and that's that's why a lot of people suck at life you know you're you 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 are not prepared for it correctly totally. all right but as an entrepreneur we're not afforded the ability to have somebody hold our hand. It's like when problems come at us, okay, you know, you got to be a problem solver. You can't go running to somebody and being like, I don't understand this. Can you take care of it for me? It's like, no, now you got to grow up and you really got to do this yourself. Right. And and that's a huge, a a huge challenge for being an entrepreneur. Um, I, I saw, I think it was in like entrepreneur magazine or something like that where somebody said uh, being an entrepreneur is like it sometimes feels like you're on like you're stranded on an island in the middle of the ocean that's just surrounded by sharks yeah you know and you're just, uh, yeah i've been there you know sometimes been very scary but the longer that i do this and the more problems that i encounter and the more that i problem solve mm. guess what you know that that comes up again and i'm just like oh okay deal with yeah. it got it no problem next day everything's fine you know so that's really what it comes down to man um it's that's really what it comes down to we are not prepared correctly in um in school and then those of us that go on to be quite successful something happened somewhere along the line where we were thrust into the position to now we have to learn for ourselves Totally. You know, a, a majority, a, a majority of people just won't do it unless they, they have a life event or they make a decision and take that leap and just say, OK, you know, I, I cut the cut the ropes. Um, the, the, that's what we that's what a lot of people would say in Hawaii. So King Kamehameha, when he wanted to conquer all of the islands, mm-hmm. he would have his army go from Oahu to Maui. And then they would cut the ropes to their boats and send them out to sea. And he would look at everybody and said, we're either taking this island or we don't go back home. Mm. You know, I mean, yeah. when you're becoming an entrepreneur, 99% of the time, you got to cut the ropes. Yeah. You Definitely. know, you can't, you can't be like, oh, well, I'll just, you know, keep, make, keep good, everything good with these people in case if I want to go back to my job. Yeah. You're leaving space for you to fail. Totally. And that's what I tell people a lot of times when I'm working with them and they're asking me, oh, you know, do you have a money back guarantee? And I said, no, I don't. Do you give refunds? No, I don't. Why not? Because I will not leave a space for you to fail. Yeah. That's it. That's an outlet of like, okay, three months. I don't like what's going on. I'm just going to quit. And I tell them I'm in business to make money, not to take money. All right. So I want you fixed and I want what's best for you. And I will work with you for 17 years. If that has to be the case, I'll work with you for 17 years, you know, and and we'll figure it out. But I'm not going to just take your money and then say, sorry, it didn't work out. See you later. (laughs) Yeah. 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 There's a, so, I mean, with that, because you just said 17 years, you would work with someone when you are working with someone uh, typically, I would assume the areas you see the most is like around the shoulders, the knees, those areas, the back, a lot of people throw out their back. What is a typical, and I know this is not, no one's typical because every single case is going to be different, but on average, what would you say like it would take someone to actually get back to a good functional body? Because I think most people think, you know, I'm going to try something once and if it doesn't work and like nothing in life that's good is like that. No. 
it takes time, it takes effort, it takes energy. So what would you say when you're typically addressing someone, you're like, hey, for the next like three months, six months, 12 months, you're going to have to be foam rolling every day, like stretching, moving around. What do you normally find? Uh, for, for the physical body, for the muscles, I tell people it's about a year. Okay. Mm. And then for nutrition, for diet, I tell people it's two years. And the reason being is that every three months, we actually replace 98 or 99% of our cells mm. in our body. Okay. And then every two years, we actually replace 100% of our atoms. Okay, so every two years, you are, from an at atomic perspective, a completely new person. Yeah. All right, and that's how long it takes to get all the bad habits, all the bad cravings, um, to rearrange your lifestyle, to rearrange your mental perspective, to get all your good gut buddies grown in again, and all the bad ones kind of flushed out, mm -hmm. okay, to heal that leaky gut, to you know, maybe even heal your uh, large intestine, your, your ascending transverse descending colon, you know, all of that stuff, it just needs to be flushed, drained, and then kind of like good riddance, and then kept that way for a while. Yeah. Where with muscle tissue, a lot of times people don't understand that the pain you're feeling has been developed, been being developed for about 10 to 15 years. Mm. That is 100% the truth. Okay. Yeah. So people wake up with pain on Wednesday and then somehow they find out about me. They see me on Friday and I'm like, Oh my goodness, man. Like this is like a pretty serious case. And they're like, what do you mean? It just started hurting two days ago. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. It's been developing in the background, okay? Yeah. It's like malware, you know? It's just been chilling yeah. in the background, like it, it, trying, taking its shots. And now the body's run out of room, okay? Your brain can't make any more changes. And mm -hmm. that's why you have pain, okay? So this started about 10 to 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it only now just turned on um, and, and made you aware of it. So when people understand that, and then we go back in their life and they're like, you know what? I was playing soccer like 15 years ago and I had this big guy tackle me and like push me at the same time. And I fell on my caustics and I remember my butt being sore. It wasn't broken, but I remember my butt being sore for about two weeks. And I'm like, that was it. That's yeah. why you're having back pain now. Okay. And they're like, Oh my goodness. I never thought, I, I never thought of it Yeah, that way. So, um, yeah, you know, if you're, if you're doing it yourself, when people work with me, it's typically around three to five sessions. Mm -hmm. I'll get them a hundred percent in about three to five sessions. Um, when they're doing it themselves and it, it's just, you know, balls, bands, bars, whatever. Yeah. Um, it can be three months on the low side to a year on the high side. Mm -hmm somewhere around there, but, uh, you just got to put the work in, you got to be consistent and, uh, you just got to have a little bit of knowledge, a little bit yeah. of intuition, you know? Totally. So man, that's, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. I broke my arm a long time ago. Uh, and I know like I have a calcium deposit or something on my scap and I've been trying to just yeah. beat this out of me for a long time. It's one of those things that I'm like, God, this yeah. is so annoying. Um, those things yeah. every single person has, like, it doesn't matter like what you've done throughout your life. Like doesn't you've matter. done, you've done something wrong. Even if you didn't know you did something wrong or like, I like jumped one time to grab so dumb, but like little kid things, I guess jumping on a trampoline. I'm like, I'm going to get that branch. Yeah. I jumped and like grabbed the branch and like, a, like just took like that 12 foot, like fall to the left side. And I'm like, okay, yep, that's yeah. it. something later in life. I like was looking up. And then you, yeah, you bounce back up and you're yep. like, oh, that really hurt. And you just go back to playing. You yeah. Know? Like you're not going to sit and be like, oh man, I got a foam roll, my quad, my, <laughs> my IT band. I got to get on my glute minimus and my lat now and open this stuff up for the next couple of days. Yep. Not saying that, bro. Like you just go back to playing, you know? So a lot of us, we messed ourselves up as kids. 
big time. And by the time we're 25, 30, oh, we just like pain starts coming out of everywhere. Yeah. You know, and we're just like, why, 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 why? Something that happened 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I talked to one of my buddies and he was like, yeah, a lot of people will be like, Oh, I just bent over and threw my back out. And he's like, ah, oh, you've been doing that for the past 10 years. Like it's not the yeah. bend over to pick your phone up that threw your back out. It's like you've yeah. been sitting in a chair and like getting hit playing hockey every weekend and like doing all these different things. Then you're like, ah, oh, that damn phone. It's heavy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, long bouts of inactivity followed by periods of intense activity. You know, everybody talks about, oh, everybody gets injured through CrossFit. CrossFit's so dangerous. No, CrossFit's intense. Yeah. Okay. And a lot of times, if you, you know, a lot of these boxes, they're not warming up people the way that they should. They have time crunches and everybody wants to get to the wad, get to the wad, get to the wad. Right. So you come in from sitting on a chair for eight hours and then you go right into a top set of five on the back squat. And then some high volume, high intensity workout, you know, and you can do that for about six months until your body says, you know what, bro, this is too much. You need to back off. You need to warm up. You need to take care of me because I'm starting to get stressed out. You can't just take a Lamborghini out and because it says 200 miles an hour on the speedometer, drive it 200 miles an hour in between every light. Yep. You know, and then when you get on the freeway, 200 miles an hour, weaving in and out of traffic, you know, yeah. you stop on a dime when you get to the parking spot. If you did that with a car, even for one day, let's say it was like the apocalypse and there were no cars yeah. on the road. If you did that for one day, by the time you got to wherever you were going, that car would be trashed. Yeah. It would be trashed. The, the wheels, the transmission, the engine would be so hot. You know, and yeah. nobody would question why that car broke down. But when we sit in an office for 10 hours, 12 hours, whatever, and then we go to a CrossFit class and we tighten up yeah. or we snap an Achilles, you know, or we tear something, it's CrossFit's fault. Yeah. And well, it's like, no, I no, mean, it's, it's not. It's not CrossFit's fault, man. You, you you know what I'm saying? You're not taking care of your body. You're not doing what you're supposed to yep. in, in order to warm up for these, these activities. Yeah. I think that all returns to awareness though. Like you were saying, it's like, mo- I would say most people have zero idea yeah. why a warm-up's even good. They're just like, mm, I don't have time for that today. So you know what? Let's just max out everything. Oh, we'll just max out. And we'll go home. Yeah. It's like, what? Yeah. Do you understand what you're saying and doing? You're like, I'm going to take my body to the end of its potential for certain muscular uh, movements without doing anything before to tell it that it's, that it needs. Yeah. To. Or after. So what would you recommend then for the movement for, so I guess moving throughout the day, keeping, getting your body into a position to be able to move better when it comes to whether that's foam rolling whether that's a good warm up before working out and then cooling down to make sure you can tell your nervous system like, Hey, chill out. We're not going max. We're not maxing yeah. out anymore. Yeah. So, uh, you know, my, my paradigm is always mobility before either you're warming up, whatever is sore from the previous day's workout, mm. or whatever you are going to be working on that day, or it could be a combination of things when you're done what I always like to do is do some form of deep stretching. Okay. Mm. Muscles are they're, they're, they're water and they're elastic. Okay. So when we get done in training, our body's very, very warm. Everything's super viscous. Yeah. A lot of times stretches that you can't get into position with beforehand. Now you can do very, very easily because mm. of neural fatigue, core temperature increase, et cetera. So uh, I, I always suggest to people doing some form of light stretching in their sticking points. After, the last thing you want to do is sit down or, or go and, uh, into your car and then drive in traffic for 45 minutes. Yeah. That's just going to tighten everything back up again. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I've, I've read some, done a little research too into stretching being that elongating 
is great for uh, the cell to produce more ATP because of the fact that it's starting that heating up and it's becoming more relaxed. So the mitochondria can function better. Yeah. Um, so oh, yeah, absolutely. It's just a beautiful thing. So stretch and relax after your workout. Don't get into the car and then go like, yeah. Do but I always recommend to people that they should roll before they stretch. Mm. Okay. After a workout, you have my permission to stretch without rolling. Okay. Mm. But if you're going to stretch just haphazardly, can't do it. You got to apply pressure first, get those muscles to chill out for a second. Okay. And then when you go to stretch, you're going to be able to expand things so much better. Yeah. So why does the pressure allow the muscles to relax? Pressure on your muscle tissue starts the production of what we call hyaluronic acid. Mm. All right. And what the hyaluronic acid is, is it's like oil for your tissue. Muscle tissue is supposed to slide right on yeah. top of each other, on top of itself, on top of the bone. And a lot of times we get what are called adhesions. They get stuck. All right. So when we're rolling the lacrosse ball on that adhesion, what we're doing is we're producing that hyaluronic acid from the cell. It's releasing and then it's allowing everything to melt and then slide again. Okay. So same thing when we exercise, we're going to be very warm. We're going to increase our core temperature. The muscle is going to be very warm. This is a perfect chance to express the elasticity of not only the muscle tissue, but the fascia yeah as well wow that's really cool yeah i had no idea i don't like is that very similar so the adhesion would be what a quote-unquote knot is in someone's uh fascial yeah yeah it can be loosely characterized as a knot yeah okay yeah because i know everyone's like i had so many knots here and there it's just kind of like the word it's like the buzzword you're like oh yeah. no it's just have knots everywhere yeah yeah and it's like go and take care of that man. go and take care of it man yeah that's uh since you talked to Ian, me and Ian have just been, be we live in the same apartment and we've just been beating ourselves up with uh, softballs and yeah. uh, we got just everything around. We're like, well, let's see. And then he'll be like, oh man, I found this one thing. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I'm over here doing this. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's alarming. A lot of times when I'm working on people, they're like, why doesn't that hurt until you touch it? And I'm like, because the muscle tissue is damaged. Like, this is where your pain is coming from. I tell people there's two types of pain in the body, the pain that you feel and the pain that your brain feels. And mm. they're completely separate. Okay? They're completely different. Your brain is trying to get you to stop using that shoulder. That's why you feel pain in the shoulder. But it's not the shoulder that's damaged. The mm. shoulder isn't damaged. Something that's aiding the shoulder or assisting the shoulder is damaged. There's 15 muscles that surround the shoulder. We need to find which one's unhealthy. And people are like, oh, well, you know, if you just press that hard anywhere, it's going to hurt, right? So I go, okay, you don't have a problem with your calf, right? No. I press into their calf. I'm like, does that hurt? No. What do you feel? I just feel pressure. That's what <laughs> muscle tissue is supposed to do. If you press on it really hard, it should refer pressure. Yeah. It should not be referring tremendous amounts of pain. So then they're like, okay, you know, these are just some of the real skeptical yeah. people I, I very rarely work with, um, you know, they're where they, they have more questions than, than anything else. And then uh, they get done, they feel tremendously better and then, and they leave and they're like believers. That, yeah. You know? Yeah. It's uh, it's real interesting how the body can dissociate itself, you from it in pain and stuff because i notice all the time people are like oh my feet hurt so much i'm like why are you wearing those shoes they're like what do you mean i'm like well your yeah. shoes are bad for your feet and they're like eh, it's fine it's just my feet i'm like yeah just your feet yep they're yeah. your feet so it's like really buying the crappiest tires there are and then wondering why you know your car blows out and crashes into the, the median on the freeway <laughs> yep it's uh it's it's incredible I I, uh, I purchased a truck in Hawaii because obviously I didn't have very much money. I purchased a tr truck in Hawaii as a 1987 Ford Ranger. It was, uh, it was like a surf truck, somebody's surf truck. Dude, this thing was so beat up, the doors wouldn't close very well. You had to raise and lower the windows with your hand. And uh, um, when I bought the truck, they had 
they, I, I can't remember what the name of the tires were, like Yokohana or something <laughs> like that. And I'm like, look at these podunk tires. I have never, ever heard yeah. of the name of this, t- these tires. I'm like, oh, well, they look okay. But if you touch them, it, the rubber was almost like a shiny plastic. And I'm like, I'm like, these things don't feel right. I'm like, oh, well, whatever. Three days later, I'm coming off the ramp. Um, I'm coming off the highway onto a ramp going about 45 miles an hour. And uh, my rear passenger tire blows out on me. And I like, thank goodness, didn't lose control of my vehicle. But I pulled over to the side and then I was like, okay, got the credit card out when it got towed to the uh, um, tire, to like Midas or something like that. Um, I'm like, just put all four new tires on there for me, yeah. please. Because these things obviously came from China or something like that. And yeah. I, I don't really want them. It's, it's <laughs> those stability. It's like the most important things, like the hands and the feet are so important. Your hands and yeah. feet up. You're, like yeah. you were talking about the atlas, the lining of your whole spine. Like yeah. certain little things that most people wouldn't notice that if you paid attention to, like you're get you're hitting like the 80, 20 of like, yeah, yeah everything's good. Yeah. But we're like, nah, we don't need any of that stuff. Yeah. A lot of, you know, um, pain's kind of like an upscale, you know, something hurts and you can gr- grit through it. People have respect for you. It's the dumbest <laughs> thing we do. It's like sleep. It's the dumbest thing. Oh, no, wow. That guy's really tough. And then, uh, you know, you're in the hospital getting three tendons and a, and a ligament re- repaired. It's like, wow, that guy's really tough. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and then they're going through the worst rehab of their life. Wow, that guy's really t- tough. I have a lot of admiration for him. Yeah. You know? And it's like, no, like, this guy did everything wrong. That was me, man. That was me. I just, I did everything wrong. You know? And everybody thought I was so tough. And I was, I didn't know better. I, nobody could help me. You know, totally. So then I have to go ahead and help myself. Yeah. It's like sleep or meditation. It's like both of those. Like a lot of times with sleep, people are like, we get three, oh, I'm getting four hours. because I got this, this, and this, like I'm doing all this shit. Yeah. And then you're like, yeah, but you're definitely not healthy. And then you're like, yeah. same with meditation. It's like, I got all this stuff going on. They're like, you can tell they're like Charlie and that meme where he's like looking at the map on the wall and he's got like shit everywhere yeah but if they just sat down and they took 30 minutes to meditate everything's categorized it's organized yeah a lot better and they get through it easier it's uh the practice yeah. of mind one of my favorite books now how like okay. he, have you ever read it no so he was a uh piano uh tuner for like magic uh, huge orchestras and like amazing symphonies and stuff like that and okay. he started to really like think about how his thoughts worked in his mind. He noticed when he was rushing and doing these things. And so he started to practice just like kind of Eckhart Tolle, like living in the now, but instead be- okay. doing things as slow and meticulous as possible. And so he would do that with tuning these like grand pianos and time himself. And he would always come out faster every uh-huh. time. But it was that slow down intentionality order, like cultivating presence, cultivating peace. Yeah that got him there. It was, it, yeah. it's, I love it. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. A hundred percent. It's uh, so a uh, couple more questions and we'll wrap up. Have you had any form of, uh, I guess, high leverage skills. And so a high leverage skill is like something that you can take and put on many different areas, whether that's like learning how to learn, whether that's like pattern recognition, but some skill that allows you to, you know, do things a lot more efficiently in your life over and over again. Is there anything like that that you've used it's, to really get where you are? Yeah, man. Um, it's my intuition, 100%. Hell yeah. Yeah, everybody needs to develop a strong intuition. And how do you do that? You got to know yourself and you got to love yourself. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows my body better than I do. And the times were, I mean, especially now, you know, if I don't have a good feeling about somebody, there's something that usually happens later on down the road, (laughs) not to me, but to that person. And I'm just like, gosh, man, like that was so on point, you know? And then the people that have, I have a really great feeling about, you know, we cultivate an amazing relationship and everything is just fantastic. Um, I use my intuition in my practice a lot. 
not only um, in in um, acquiring clients, but also in, in being able to get them healthy mm-hmm. and whatnot, you know, and uh, a lot of people, you know, not a lot of people, some people, they just, they, they wouldn't even know where to start with intuition, you know, and, and that's just not really being in touch with yourself um, as much as you should to being, it's, it's, it's oftentimes more, more often than not just being disconnected, you know, yeah. um, with, with the, so, you know, social media is a, a big pet peeve of mine. And, uh, there, there were a couple of things recently that I had seen that, uh, just kind of made me chuckle or made me think. And <clears throat> one of them is, uh, how mean people are to other people on social media. Um, you know, forget Instagram, forget Facebook. If you go on YouTube and you read the comments on YouTube, people have utter disregard. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. They just have straight up utter disregard for somebody else's feelings, for somebody else's respect for them as a human being. Like all of that is gone. I use Rich Froning as an example. Mm-hmm. He put a um, he he put up a I think it was like a ten or fifteen second video on Instagram, and it was him. He was doing snatches and legless mm-hmm. rope climbs. Now all this guy did was post a workout, and he said so and so and I did two rounds of this. One would have been sufficient, you know. And he's putting it out there just to help everybody and say, hey, look at this great workout yeah okay well he got done with his last snatch and he looked at the clock and he turned around and walked away and obviously you can see like the bald spot that he has on the top of his head now he's had that for a very long time yeah all right and somebody the first comment the guy goes "Uh uh-oh richie getting a little bit of male pattern baldness there are you and then you know, Rich just commented back. He goes, it's been like that for a while, buddy, but thanks for noticing. Yeah. And I'm like, if this cat was standing in front of Rich Froning, <laughs> he would not go up to him and say something like that. And I don't even think Rich is a violent dude. Yeah, no. Okay. But he would not go up and say something like that to him. And you just, people pull no punches. They let everything go everything go yeah. and um then the other thing too which coincides with that is uh tim ferris actually put something up i think it was on his twitter and um he said one second i have yeah. it right here 50 percent of the internet equals people doing nothing yeah. saying you're not doing enough to people actually doing something mm-hmm you know, and that's not just really like, yeah, it is the internet, but more importantly, it's definitely social media. You know, yeah. you put something out there to try and help somebody and someone like, you know, and this isn't really social media. It, it is, but kind of it isn't. But uh, my knee pain Bible, somebody put a two star review up for my knee pain Bible. And th- this guy just ripped the book shreds. He's like, this is not a Bible. This is just basic. Like anybody that needs to know something about if you don't know anything about knee pain then maybe you should get this but at $25 it's overpriced and blah 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 and he just he like he went on and he gave it a two-star review and I'm looking at it and I'm like I'm like how, how many books have you read yeah or I'm, I'm sorry how many how many books have you written yeah you, you, you know what I'm saying and to me this is the knee pain Bible because I suffered for knee pain with knee pain for 16 years and every single one of these exercises in here helped me get rid of it. So if you have knee pain for 15, 16 years and you create exercises to get rid of it, I think that you do have the liberty to call it the knee pain Bible. And by the way, $25 and the cost of a softball and a baseball and a lacrosse ball, which is maybe another $10, is a very, very small price to pay to take away anybody's knee pain. Yeah. I don't care if you're the Pope or whoever, bro, like 35 bucks, you cannot go into a single office in the United States of America and say, can you look at my knee for $35 and yeah. take the pain away? 
You yeah. can't. And, you know, once again, it's like this guy has no reverence whatsoever for the fact that I wrote that book to help people. Yeah. He's looking at it from his own mind and what his own perception of value is. And then he writes a review that may potentially scare a customer away that I could help. Yeah. Somebody that could have bought that book, done the exercises and taken away their knee pain. They're like, Oh gosh, it's, it's a, it's a crappy book. I'm not going to, I'm not going to read it yeah. now. You know, so it's stuff like that. 50% of the internet, yeah. you know, people saying you're not doing enough to people who are actually doing something. Yeah. I think <clears throat> I really think a lot of it just comes down to people being, they're just not okay with themselves and they don't understand no, that. Like, yeah, change, totally. They're like change takes a long time. And so like to pay 35 bucks to change your life, to pay a thousand dollars to change your life that's worth it yeah. always oh yeah 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 absolutely yeah no so it's one, of, it's one of those things that so last thing is there anything that you're currently questioning and so that can be uh politics how doorknobs work um relationships anything what uh what have you been going like Everyone's like, yeah, I think it works that way. And you're like, mm, I really don't think it does. So you know what, honestly, bro, it's a statement. When people say you're going to sleep like a baby, mm. okay, I have started to question that statement because my wife and I just gave birth December 13th. Congratulations. And thank you. Thank you. And I, I watch the sleep patterns of babies. They don't really sleep that well, man. Yeah. I don't, I, so I don't understand. I, <laughs> I question that statement. Okay. Oh, you're going to sleep like a baby at night. Yeah. You know? And it's just like, okay, like babies don't sleep good. <laughs> ours, ours actually sleeps better than most. So like my wife goes to a mommy and me class on Wednesdays and mm. she tells me some of the horror stories about, you know, kids are waking up every two hours every three hours our baby she doesn't nap very well but we'll put her down at like 7 seven thirty, and she won't wake up till 6 30. wow and then there there are some times where she'll wake up at three and then she'll wake up at 7 30. Mm -hmm. you know so at the beginning when she was first born obviously my wife was waking up two three times a night but now that she's four and a half nearly five months old um she's doing much better and sleeping much better um, but still, you know, her sleep, her sleep is broken yeah, and whatnot. So that's, I, I know it might sound silly, but I was thinking about that the other day. <laughs> I was like, why do people say sleep like a baby? Cause babies don't sleep well. And they mean it in like an endearing term. Like you're going to sleep so good tonight. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like, no, baby, babies do not sleep well. They're sleep terrorists till, till they're about four years old, you know, totally. and then they're not babies anymore. Yeah. So probably marketing to be honest it's like yeah. you always see pictures of like babies sleeping like oh look at how cute he is oh look at that little angel yeah, yeah. for 15 minutes yeah yeah it's like just wait till he gets into the uh, the arts and crafts box then then you have the fun yeah yeah awesome well before we wrap up chris where can people find you uh www.influentialhealthsolutions.com you can find me on Amazon, Christopher J. Kodowski, and then on Facebook as well, Christopher J. Kodowski, uh, Chris Kodowski on Twitter, and Chris Kodowski on Instagram. Um, I apologize to everybody. I'm just I'm not very active on my social media platforms. I see seven to eight, sometimes up to eleven people a day, and it just I I have I I don't know how some people do it. I know they hire teams or get people or whatever. I tried that even once and you know, the, the people that were trying to help me, they're like, Hey man, can you do this, do that, do this, do that? I'm like, no, I have no time. Yeah. Don't you understand? <laughs> and then on, on the weekend, I don't want to be doing stuff for my social media platform. I want to hang out with my wife and my baby. Like, yeah. so um, if anybody reaches out to me on those platforms, I will get back to you. It might take a day or two for me to realize that I have a notification or something like that the best way to get in touch with me though is just email chris at influentialhealthsolutions.com 
I'll, I'll check my email every day and get back to you the same day. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on, man. I love, uh, I love the breadth of subjects that we got to cover. Yeah, man. Thank you, Austin, so much. I appreciate you having me on. Awesome.